Sometimes people say we need a change of heart. Is that the actual beating heart? No, it's the change of our attitude. Or we might say we need a transformation of our mind. Does that mean our physical brain? No, it's changing the way we think about things. As a kid, I knew I was different because I was born with a disability, but I didn't necessarily want to see myself that way. When in public, as a younger person, more insecure, I remember actually avoiding eye contact with strangers sometimes because I didn't want to be reminded in their glances, in their looks, that I was in fact different. Sometimes people will blatantly label me uh, right off the bat as being disabled and therefore some kind of a certain type of person, whereas sometimes it's more of a subconscious labeling where uh, they will offer me help in ways that I don't necessarily need it, uh, subconsciously thinking that I am incapable of acting like a normal person. When people label me, um, I think it definitely makes me self-conscious and maybe a little bit even annoyed because I feel they don't have a true representation of who I am on the inside, but even on the outside, uh, there might be a, a misunderstanding and so I want to overcome as quickly as possible that perception that they have of me. So I didn't like being labeled and judged as I grew up, but I started to realize that in return, I was actually starting to label and judge people who I was putting in boxes who might not necessarily be uh, what they truly were. I realized that God changed the way I saw the external self. Um, we don't have to be defined by the way we look, by the way we um, seem to other people. We are defined by His inward work. Um, on us, in our heart, and then we can live out of that truth rather than be bound by certain limitations that we might have and challenges. So my first realistic painting was asked for by a friend who wanted a lion to remind him of Aslan from Narnia series. Um, and so I did that, and then my other friend saw that lion and was blown away by it, so he asked for a tiger. So that got me into doing a series of feline paintings. <laughs> Throughout my life, people may have labeled me and I may have even limited myself, but through the blessings that God's given me, through the talents and passions, I've had so many opportunities to uh, be a professional painter, do a Masters of Arts in English, and be a senior editor at a magazine, and even founded my own magazine, and I've just realized that I'm not limited. As I've come to realize that I am more than I might originally seem, I also have realized that everyone is more than they might originally seem, and the boxes that we put people in, the ways that we see them, aren't actually their full selves. And as we get to know people and we get to establish relationship, then the true heart and glory of God can be seen and is seen through every individual. I think my, uh, my closest friends growing up, I had three, we all had matching tattoos, not sure if you wanna include that. Um, they, were, they stuck with me through my <laughs> weird homeschool phase and taught me that I really do have potential that they saw in me, that I didn't have to conform to a certain way of being, that they would love me and encourage me no matter what, and that really made me into the confident person that I am today. Hello family, and hello those of you on the YouTube chat and on Discord. My name is Dewan, and I will be your live stream host for today. I just wanna thank you for accepting God's invitation to worship with us together in community. I know that you can pray on your own, you can read your Bible on your own, but when you accept God's invitation to join your hearts with us, we are so thankful to be able to do this together. And we know that God isn't limited by space or by time, that whether you're watching this live or you're watching this as a recording, that when you accept God's invitation for worship, you can have a divine encounter with him right now in this moment. So we thank you so much for joining us in celebrating his greatness. Okay, 
the video. Thank you so much, Connor, for sharing your story and for sharing your words of wisdom. So he said some key things there. One thing he said was, a change of heart is a change of attitude. And the transformation of the mind is changing the way we think about things. And we know that when we experience God's peace, that helps us to change our attitude and to change the way that we think about things. And when we embrace God's presence in our lives, the Holy Spirit transforms us and allows us to see ourselves the way that God sees us, right? So, and that gives us the boldness to use our talents, our skills, and our abilities to share God's love and his peace to those around us. And that is the heart of our Peacemakers campaign. That's what our Peacemakers campaign is all about. So for those of you that don't know about our Peacemakers campaign, let me tell you a little bit about it. So we are in the second week of our Peacemakers campaign. And our Peacemakers campaign is an annual campaign that we run in support of peace, peace building efforts through the Mennonite Central Community in the areas of indigenous and settler reconciliation efforts locally, restorative justice work in prisons, peace building programs in sub-Sahara Africa, and humanitarian effort, relief efforts in Iraq. So one way that you can get involved with us is to start a fundraiser. And running a fundraiser is a great way for you to use your talents and your skills and your abilities to share God's peace and share his love with others, um, as we said. So, and it also helps you to um, invite people from your networks, right? Invite your pe people in your networks to get involved with you. So to start a fundraiser or participate in one, you can go to themeetinghouse.com slash fundraisers. So, so far we have raised, drum roll please, $65,950. Great job, family. And this is towards our goal of $150,000. We are so thankful for all that you've done so far. And we encourage you to keep going. So we are gonna check out this video, highlighting our friend Carolyn, who's a part of our Oakville family. And she's gonna show how she's using her gift of crafting to make an impact locally and globally for Jesus. Hi, I'm Carolyn, and I'm part of the Oakville Parish. Gosh, I've been crafting for, I think, all my life. Last year during the pandemic, I had the idea to use some of my crafting to raise some money for the Peacemakers campaign because I couldn't gather and have a fundraiser event. I've had fun using my passion for crafting to find a purpose in what I do. Uh, I have a small business now and everything I create is great, but what I really love to do is anything I have with the word peace in it. So things like my decals, I'm donating 100% of the proceeds to peacemakers. This isn't that hard for me, but that's because I've been doing this for years. I think a lot of us have these skills or talents that we're already doing. It's just paying attention to what you already are passionate about and doing it. Gosh, what have I gotten out of this? I'm finding myself finding other ways to want to to dig in and how I can support and use what I'm already doing to help others. Because of the pandemic, I was limited to only being able to use my online presence through social media. And through that, I was surprised by the success that it had. So this year, I'm gonna continue with that, but also reach out to my neighborhood and my community here. Another way that we use our resources here at The Meeting House to make an impact for Jesus locally and globally is with our giving. So if you call Meeting House home, it is our normal rhythm to offer a monetary gift when we gather. You can make a one-time gift or a recurring gift, um, and we invite you to please offer your gift at themeetinghouse.com slash give. With your help and with the monetary blessings that we've received, we've been able to share God's love and peace with others in our community and beyond. And for that, we thank you. Okay, so for our teaching portion today, Carmen is going to be having a dialogue with Samuel Sarpia, who is our discipleship pastor here at The Meeting House. And they will be sharing what it means to be a peace witness. Okay, so it's time for us to engage in musical worship, family. So before we go, let's pray. Triune God, 
all-knowing and ever-present Father. As we continue to offer our hearts to you in worship today, we ask for you the blessing of your Holy Spirit to be felt in our gathering today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Before we start music, I'm going to read this prayer. So feel free to stand and sing with us if you want. We'll dive in. But I'm just going to pray this. Lord, I come before you ready to pour out my worries, anxieties, and fears at your feet. I am claiming and declaring your promises for blessings of peace and strength over my life. Bring peace into my soul that passes all worldly understanding and make me a light for others to see your strength. John 14, 27 says, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not be afraid.
The priestly blessing. The Lord said to Moses, tell Aaron and his sons, this is how you are to bless the Israelites. Say to them, the Lord bless you and keep you. 
Lord, make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. So they will put my name on the Israelites and I will bless them. So we can sing this blessing over one another this morning. Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. Lord, turn his face toward you and give you peace. I'll sing that again. Lord, bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. Lord, turn his face toward you and give you peace. Yes, Lord. Oh. He's for you, he's for you, he's for you, 
Amen. Father has sent me, I am sending you, Jesus. Peace is something we must all work for, every day, in every country. Ban Ki-moon. We are not at peace with others because we are not at peace with ourselves. And we are not at peace with ourselves because we are not at peace with God. Thomas Merton. When we bear witness, when we become the situation, homelessness, poverty, illness, violence, death, the right action arises by itself. We don't have to worry about what to do. We don't have to figure out solutions ahead of time. Peacemaking is the function of bearing witness. Once we listen with our entire body and mind, loving action arises. Bernie Glassman. We need to pledge ourselves anew to the cause of Christ. We must capture the spirit of the early church. Wherever the early Christians went, they made a triumphant witness for Christ. Whether on the village street or in the city jails, they daringly proclaimed the good news of the gospel. Martin Luther King Jr. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. I do not give it to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, do not be afraid. Jesus. Good morning, my friends, both here in the room, in the live stream at our parishes. What a fantastic morning to be together. Good morning, Samuel. Good morning, Kevin. All right, so you'll notice that there's two of us up here today, and that makes me really excited. So we're in week three of our Peace Be With You series, and um, I think I'm a relatively familiar face. I'm Carmen Bookma. I'm a senior pastor here. It's fantastic to teach today, but... I am not alone. I'm with Samuel, and I want to introduce Samuel to you. I hope many of you know him or have been introduced to him. Samuel is our discipleship pastor. Samuel, how long have you been with us now? I've lost track. Uh, yesterday turned six months okay. to the day I arrived in the GTA. Happy half birthday. Oh, thank you. I should have got you a cake or something. I forgot. I had no, no idea. You can still get it after. <laughs> <laughs> So Samuel's our discipleship pastor. It's been such a treat to have him on our staff, already doing fantastic work with our elders, our home churches, giving uh, strategy, heart, and passion to who we are as a church when it comes to discipleship. Samuel's married. You have three lovely daughters who I have the privilege of getting to know. I think they're all awesome. I hope you think the same. Ask their mother. And along with being our discipleship pastor, Samuel has this incredible passion for peacemaking. You'll learn as he shares some stories this morning, and hopefully as you get to know him over the years of you being here, there's a passage passion, but also a depth of knowledge when it comes to peace, justice, and reconciliation. So I'm really excited for you to share a little bit with us today. But before we kind of do that, I just want to kind of jump in and start, recap for us where we find ourselves. If you have the notes, you'll see this in your notes as well. We, and maybe you're just joining us for the first time, we're in week three of our Peacemaker series. Uh, The this, this series is titled Peace Be With You, and you can see we're on week three. We've been breaking that down, looking at the different elements of what does it mean to actually be a peacemaker? What does that look like for us as followers of Jesus, and what does that mean? And we've been trying to line this up, not perfectly, but we're also aware that as a church, we're in our peacemaker campaign. And so we intentionally have these conversations side by side to say, as we're trying to be mobilized as a church, with radical generosity and creativity to be peacemaking agents in the communities we find ourselves, we want to wrestle with that and talk about it and look at it theologically. So week one, we just talked about, okay, so theologically, what is the theology of peace? What does Jesus actually have to say to us about the idea of peace and being being a peacemaker? 
And last week, if you were here, if you caught it on our live streams, Quincy and, and Steve were here just talking about that e idea of being, of the presence, of what does it mean to be in our places, our neighborhood places, and being agents of peace there. And this week, we're just going to continue to build on that. It just continues to build. Quincy and Steve did a lot of groundwork for us to talk about that idea of presence, of being with. And so that's where we find ourselves today. And I want us to start by looking at those words of Jesus that actually shaped for us the title of our series here. So in John 20, you can see on the slide, these are the words of Jesus. And he says to his disciples, and we'll talk a bit about the context in a minute, but peace be with you as the Father has sent me, I am sending you. So it's not like we just kind of came up with a title. We wanted to fall, continue to follow the words of Jesus as we shape what it means to be a peacemaker. So let's dive into that. So Samuel, as we look at the context here of John 20, these words of Jesus that say, peace be with you, take us through that a bit. What comes to your mind? Teach us a little bit from this passage. Yeah. Uh, before we dive into the passage, or before I dive into talking about the passage itself, I, I want us to imagine that these two words were the first words spoken by Jesus. This couple of words were the first words spoken by Jesus on the day of his, the first day of his resurrection. And today we have the privilege of actually looking right through the corridors of history and we look at, oh, yeah, we know this was spoken by Jesus. But bear this in mind that earlier in the day, John and Peter and the disciples were all locked up behind closed doors. They were all sitting in fear because the event of the weekend has really rattled every sense of being in them. Mm. The event of the crucifixion of Jesus, the event of knowing that this Jesus, their teacher, this prophet, who has taught, who has healed many, who has done countless miraculous things, all of a sudden, he's crucified, buried, and now what? So these disciples are all at a lost, and being at a lost, they don't even know what to do, where to go. And then all of a sudden, on that same very fateful morning, Mary Magdalene came running and saying to them, he is not there. They have stolen his body. Can you imagine the emotional sense of, after be, uh, the emotional sense of being wrecked completely? They were hoping that this Jesus that said, had proclaimed he was going to resurrect, had proclaimed all of this. And so these disciples were hiding behind closed doors. And when they heard the words of Mary, John and James, uh, John and P Peter and John, raced right through the town. I want you to imagine Peter and John with the eerie feeling of what is going on or what has taken place with the sense of emotion, the brokenness, the sense of we don't know how this, this is going to turn out. But if they have stolen his body, finally we know, we're not sure of all the teachings that he's been talking about. What now? What are we going to do? So they ran to the grave and they raced. And the, the story in John really describes it so well. It says they ran and Pete, John kind of overran Peter. And so when, when, when they got to there, when they got to the tomb, John kind of paused. And Peter came bolting. I imagine a cartoon, you know, for those of you that, that have watched cartoons. I imagine a cartoon, if you, if you watch Road, Road Runner, now I'm dating myself. Yeah. I imagine you come and bolt in. Peter probably knock off John and run into the, uh, into the tomb. And finally, he got the deja vu moment. Can you picture Peter? Coming back to the rest of the disciples and saying, yes, it is true they have stolen his body because we can see the cloth that he was wrapped in. And so that further intensified the terror, the fear of what will happen to this, what, what is going to happen to us? Are the Jewish leaders going to now come and arrest us? Mm -hmm. And now when Jesus, all of a sudden behind closed doors, showed up and says, peace be with you. When you say peace be with you, then you are actually saying let God's rest, comfort, wholeness, and assurance go with you. I'll say that again. Let God's comfort, rest, wholeness, and assurance go with you. 
That means in every area of your life. But I assure you, these disciples have no any reason to sense that sense of God's comfort because these here yeah, are they hopeless. And sometimes in our own very lives, we find ourselves in a situation like the disciples. The situation of life has probably knocked us off and we found ourselves behind closed doors and locked and shut and somebody is probably whispering, peace be with you. And you're going, what are you talking about? But something about the presence of Jesus that cast away fear. If you look on this slide here, the, the, the presence of Jesus showing up behind that door, in the, behind closed doors, with all the fear and all the signs and all that sense of we don't know what. And here is Jesus saying, peace be with you. The presence of Jesus immediately is meant to cast away the fear of all the anxiety of, the, of what had happened throughout the weekend. The, that sense of knowing that finally what Jesus had said about himself will come to, has come to fruition. And this kind of takes me back to the story of, uh, in John chapter 8, the story of the woman caught in the very act of adultery. And you know, the, 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 the scripture in John account that they dragged her the rulers of the Lord dragged her before Jesus and they were about to stone her. And can you imagine the kind of fear and terror that this woman was going through? And then all of a sudden, Jesus said, if you who has no sin cast the first stone and they were gone. And Jesus said to this woman, go and sin no more. The presence of Jesus in the face in, with this woman cast away every single fear that she ever had. At the same time, if you remember back in the same, the Luke gives us the account of Jesus encountering Peter when, when he said to them, Put, throw your net on the other side. And so when Peter scooped up all this fish, he said, Oh, depart from me, I am a sinful man. And instead of Jesus really confirming or affirming all that Peter, Peter's fear was, Jesus said to him, I will make you fishers of men. It's fascinating what the presence of Jesus can do to us. The presence of Jesus not only casts away fear, but it brings peace through challenges. We know that in the account of this story, we find that in this story that these disciples were in a time of turmoil in their own personal life. They were afraid of what is about to happen. They are afraid of, should now that this teacher is gone, maybe let's go back to our own fishing business. But we have already been marked by people we have already been identified as the followers of the way. How can we then go through life in this present moment? And the presence of Jesus, when he says, peace be with you. He says, even through these challenges, the peace of God, the peace that I live will be with you. The presence of God. The peace of God brings the presence of purpose. Wow. All of a sudden, when Jesus showed up in that room and behind the closed doors, when he said, utters those words, peace be with you. All of a sudden, he said, as the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. All of a sudden, the disciples that are all down and discouraged, they are almost hot, as having a sense of hopelessness, now have a new sense of purpose. And the new sense of purpose is to go and do what God has called them to do. And he, to go, not only to go, but he promised that his presence will always give them purpose. Friends, when I think about all of these different uh, points that I've just mentioned, and that's not all. This is not exhaustive by any means. But the presence of Jesus cast away fear. The presence of Jesus takes us through challenges. And the presence of Jesus gives us purpose. Yeah. I, well, there you go, guys. I, don't, I can, this is great, Samuel. It's so good. And I think what we need to, I'm just sort of stunned, right? Like, preach it. It's amazing. The, 
I think where you're taking us is somewhere really significant. And you and I talked about the Great Commission, which I want to get to yeah. in just a minute. But you've laid a great fa foundation. And I want us to follow here with what Samuel is saying. We look at what Jesus, the context within which Jesus came and spoke to his disciples. And the presence of Jesus does everything you just said for them. But he does that for us too. And I want you to think for just a minute, a circumstance, maybe like the disciples, that sense of like impending doom of everything they'd put their hope in, everything that they had followed has been essentially at this point for them taken and they don't know what's next. And like Samuel has said, they go and hide behind a locked door and are there stories and circumstances in your lives, in our lives, where that's just what we want to do. Like, forget this, I just want to be behind a locked door. But the presence of Jesus does those very same things for you too. There's a casting out of fear. We don't need to hold on to fear. And there's a, there's a promise that there's a presence through whatever challenges we're experiencing, even behind those locked doors. And then there's a call to something greater. There's a call to action. And I want us to understand the significance of Jesus' presence for us. Because that's almost step one as we talk about peacemaking and this idea of uh, presence of being with. This idea of Jesus' presence being known in our lives is what allows us to then do that last point that you said of that call into the presence of purpose. So let's go there a little bit, this idea of, so what is it, what's the purpose that Jesus calls us to? You said there, as the Father sent me, I am sending you. Let's run with that a little bit. Take us a little further. And you know, when Jesus stood behind, those clo behind the closed doors along with them without unlocking the door, when he says, as the Father sends me, so I am sending you. He was, Jesus was not sending them all alone. He was not sending them to go by themselves. He says, I am with you. And the with is an assurance that wherever they go, whatever they do, whatever they say, they are not only saying it because they are on their own, yeah. but they have the backing, the presence, the anointing, and the spirit of Jesus along with them. We see that in the Great Commission in Matthew 28, when Jesus was, about, was ascended unto heaven, he says, Go ye into all the world and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then he made that same promise, and I will be with you. The emphasis is not only on the eye, but with, with I shows the presence, but with again shows the accompaniment of Jesus in, in, the, in, in, in the event of proclaiming the gospel, in the event of making disciples. So we see Jesus sends us to bring peace to this broken world by first of all loving and forgiving each other. You know, oftentimes we think we can proclaim peace, 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 but it is easy to talk about peacemaking and proclaiming peace. But in within ourselves, the first step to proclaiming this peace is to love and forgive each other where wrong has been done. I know for myself, I personally, I, as somebody who is really passionate about peacemaking, I long, I, I am, when I know somebody is not happy with me, or I have stepped on somebody's toes, which I do almost every day of my life. But what I do is, what I know is, I long to seek to live in peace by seeking for forgiveness. Because when I do that, it allows me to be able to sleep peacefully. Because I'm that kind of person that if I know somebody's mad at me or something is not going well, I cannot just pretend as if nothing uh, that nothing is uh, happening. I will humbly go ask, and for me, it is out of a conviction. So the, the commission that Jesus is calling us is to love and forgive each other first before we even think about proclaiming the gospel to the outside world. And in loving each other and forgiving each other, which is very challenging. Friends, I'm not making light of this. This is not a walk in the park or some kind of a cakewalk to say, oh, I forgive. And, and we've, sometimes we've turned, as followers of Jesus, we've turned this forgiveness to be a cliche. We've turned it into, oh, yeah, I forgive you. But the next time you do it, I remind you that you remember you did it the last time and I forgive, forgive you. You can't do this again. Did you really forgive? The presence of Jesus that calls us with a purpose begins with loving and forgiving. And the second, and you rem before I even get to the second point, you remember when Peter, Peter and the disciples can recount 
when Peter himself can recount how, how he dropped Jesus last minute. When the, when the arrest of Jesus happened, the disciples followed really closely. In their following, they denied him. They said, we don't know him. But yet, Jesus did not hold on to that. He forgave them and still commission them. So when we are called to love and forgive each other, the second thing we're called to do is to, well, excuse me, I'm blanking. We're called to work for peace and reconciliation. No, yes, we're called to work for peace and reconciliation. I'm sorry. The slide will tell us what to do. Okay, the slide will tell me what to do. The presence of Jesus, (laughs) it calls me to love our community with its brokenness. I want to tell you the truth is we live in a broken world. We don't live in this perfect world. We might live in the Western world that we have all the Western amenities that defines us as civilized, but we are as broken as any other non-civilized world. So the presence of Jesus compels us. This call is for us not to just seek our comfort, but to seek and love out the brokenness of our community by bringing his healing. And then the last part of the, the commission that Jesus is commissioned is, is to work for peace and reconciliation. Oh boy, if there's any generation, and I know every generation will say this, if there's any generation that desperately needs to see reconciliation as the forefront of, of everything that we say and do, it is a reconciliation between families, reconciliation between communities, reconciliation between racial groups, reconciliation between nations, reconciliation between tribes. We are for the becoming more tribal. And the prayer, the commission that Jesus calls his disciples, he says, when you go, I want you to be a presence of a witness of reconciliation in this broken world. Amen. (laughs) Oh, man, I'm, uh, okay. Samuel, you're making me tear up. I've got makeup on, okay? Can't make me tear up. That's, it's so true, though, and I think that's, that, so like if we could just kind of keep the sequencing going, so what it means to be with is first understanding Jesus' presence for ourselves. And it's out of then that place of Jesus' presence in us that allows us to move and do these things in the communities where we find ourselves. So Samuel, let's get to story time. Tell us, where have you seen this? Like, what does it mean to be a peace witness in the place of the call that God's given you? Uh, you know, last week, uh, Steve kind of talked about the, the bee in the community, and just be with the place, the theology of place, and the compound interest of your consistency of working in a specific location, or just your neighborhood. And I tell you, uh, in my own personal journey, the last number of years when, when God called my family to plant a church in Rockford, Illinois, uh, for those of you that don't know where Rockford, Illinois is, it's somewhere at the end of this pew. I'm kidding. <laughs> it's in the U.S. It's in... Illinois. It's a sec- it goes between the second and the third largest city in the state of Illinois. And so when we were there as a church planters, we were planting up a, a, a typical Anabaptist church. And a typical Anabaptist church means we seek to reflect the peace of Jesus in the community of our calling. So I, I arrive in this, we arrive in this community, and this community is divided by all the isms that you can think of. Mm-hmm. Racial, socioeconomic, uh, Tri- basically, tr- we have become too tribal. And one of the things that we notice is, is God calls us as a church to be a church that brings reconciliation to this city. What are we going to do? How are we going to do this? So we began to network with communities. And it took about five years, right? And I'm so glad that Steve mentioned, that he said, when it, it's only after five years that you might begin to see some move. And that does not mean it's static, because God doesn't work by the time bound that we have bound for ourselves. But uh, he's just talking sociologically. So in five years, by the end of the fifth year, as we were really wanting to bring reconciliation between the factioning group, the racial, racially minority community and, and the uh, racially majority community, and just as we thought that things were working, two white police officers shot a teenager in the basement of a black church next to a daycare with about 20 kids, right, shut him in cold blood. And as you know, this is before George Floyd. This is before Backtrack Black Lives Matter. This is way back in 2009. And the city erupted in a riot. And of course, when the riot, it's all come and gone, the news media is gone, and so what? 
those compound interests of those relationships that we built began to surge. The community started asking, how can we be? We have heard you talk about this message of peace and reconciliation. We've heard you demonstrate it. You've demonstrated it with many things that you've done in the community. And so the question that people were beginning to ask is, Samuel, what are some ways forward that we can unite? And together with the police department and the community, we formed not just a group that works together, we strategically began to intentionally work to prevent such a future occurrence, and not only prevent the future occurrence, but to be able to say, what are some constructive programming that we can do to prevent such a young man from going off the street and ending up being killed? And so in partnership with the police, the city, and the citizens, compound interest led to us teaming up. And so when, uh, when George Floyd was killed, mm -hmm. the story of Rockford is different from the story of cities across America. The story of Rockford is a story that the police and the community express their own grievance at this, together and at the same time. That shows that when we as a church truly take this message of peace, the, the being a peace witness to the communities for which God has called us, I believe that we will see the result in our lifetime. We're not just going to wait until we get to by and by the kingdom of God, but I believe that God wants to use us as a church to be an instrument of peace. Even as we, I see our involvement in the Peacemaker campaign, it is one of those things that's life-given. Amen. So can we? Yeah, amen. <laughs> if that isn't just a beautiful picture of the church being a peace witness, and your story is, is obviously one that uh, it almost truthfully, Samuel, feels a little unattainable. Like, wow, like your church, because of the consistent presence over time, had an impact in an entire city. And I think my propensity, just as a, a meek follower of Jesus, is like, that's lovely, that's never going to happen for me. But I think if there's one thing I want, want us to embrace and to hear from a story like that is, let's backtrack to day one, not year five, of the faithful understanding of what it meant to embrace Jesus' presence mm -hmm. and then respond to his call to be a peace witness where we are. And that same call is true of us as a church, as the meeting house, and that same call is true of individually us as followers of Jesus. And so as we kind of wind ourselves down, we get to the space of just sort of saying, what is, pay attention to maybe what God is stirring up within you. What is he stirring up within you? Is it, what's, pay attention to the spirit that he's given you to say, what, what is he saying to you about what it means to be a peace witness, to be with? Where does Jesus want you to be with? And maybe before we even get there, the step that is required for you is to say, Jesus is saying, come embrace my presence for yourself. Come embrace the truth of what it means when my presence is alive in your life. Fear doesn't need to have a space. There's a presence through whatever challenges we have, and there's a call to a purpose, and that call is to be with others and to then uh, share with them the presence of Jesus. And so that peace witness keeps growing and growing. And the place we wanted to sort of land as we, as we uh, finish today are the words of in other words of Jesus, that actually come a few chapters before Jesus' death and resurrection. And it's almost like Jesus is preparing his disciples for what's to come. Jesus and his love and in his goodness in knowing the journey his disciples will take says in John 14, these words, John 14, 27, it's so well known. He says this, peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Don't let your hearts be troubled and don't be afraid. Mm. These are the words of Jesus for each of us, knowing that we're going to experience challenges, knowing that what the world calls peace is actually very different than what the presence of Jesus is able to do. And in Samuel, your story is a beautiful example of that. We have the gift of bringing peace to a world in a way that the world can't yet experience. And that's our call. And so Samuel, how do we do this? Like, was we like wrap this up? Give us, some, give us some takeouts. Give us some yeah, applications. We, 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 we don't have to, you don't have to imagine going out of this place and start changing a city. But there are some simple applications that you can put in your own daily practice that can be able to enable you to be able to be that peace witness. Listen to others. Yeah. We live in a world that we are, we are always kind of just on a speed dial, telling, telling, telling. Pay attention to how you listen to people. When you listen to people's stories and challenges and respond to it, 
uh, by signing up to volunteer in your community. When you do that, it shows the manifestation because wherever you go, you carry the presence of Jesus with you. And lastly, some of the little things you can do is to adv be an advocate for peace by your presence. Have you seen any injustice lately? Are there ways that your voice can help to right the wrong? I believe the Spirit of God will speak to us and we'll just take this three points. Mm. Thank you. Yeah, thanks so much, Samuel, for your stories, for the wisdom that you've shared with us. And uh, my invitation for us as we close is to pay attention to how Jesus says we're able to do this. In, in John 14, he says, um, like, I'm leaving you with a gift, right? Jesus left his spirit. And he says a little bit earlier, like, you'll do far more than I ever did because of my spirit. So let's be a people that are known and identified by being peace witness wherever we go. And know that that's going to look different than what the world gives. So it may feel like it's not quite right that we're going against the grain. And that might exactly be what Jesus is calling us to. Let me pray for us. Jesus, thank you that you have always, you've peppered throughout your time on earth and through your word this message of peace. Oh, in your goodness and in your kindness, you knew full well that we would need to hear that over and over and over again. And I pray that we are a people that by your spirit can truly embrace your presence for ourselves. That we truly, we, we truly encounter you and our lives are changed by you, but God, may it not stop there. May that just compel us to action, compel us to be with, compel us to be a presence wherever you have placed us, our own families, our neighborhoods, our schools, our places of work. God, may we not overcomplicate this. May we simply be faithful to the call you've given us wherever you have placed us. And then we pray that you, by what only your power can do, that there is a movement of peace a movement of peace as we have defined our culture, our neighborhoods, our world as a place of polarization, as a place of divisiveness. God, I truly believe that by your presence, that can change. And we invite you to move through us and with us, partner with us to be a peacemaking agent, a presence wherever you have placed us. And may there be transformation because of it. And we pray all of this in your name. Amen. Hello, family. I pray that you were encouraged today to continue to embrace the presence of Jesus and also felt that call to action, right? Um, we talked about being in the presence of God and experiencing his divine presence, and we've been here together watching, you know, how his word has been presented to us. How do we now move from watching to participation? Because biblical worship isn't passive, right? We are active disciples. So one of the things that we do here at the Meeting House and we encourage you to participate in is online or in-person house churches um, where we can come together person to person, face to face, or on screen to on screen, but we're able to converse and we're able to talk about the things that we've learned and we've, and we've spoken about today. Um, I wanna share with you just a little bit of what we're sharing in home churches this week. Um, one of the things that we're encouraging our home churches to do is talk about all three weeks of the teaching series so far, so peace, be, and with, and speaking about how the Holy Spirit is speaking to our hearts, what's resonated to us, what stood out the most, if, is there a new learning, um, something that's been a good reminder to you, or even something that maybe you don't agree with or you don't yet understand. So just encouraging you to come together so you can experience more of Christ together as community and we can continue to do this journey together. Just wanna encourage you to do that. If you visit our website, you'll be able to see how you can connect with home churches. And also, if you have any further questions, feel free to contact us at askthemeetinghouse.com. And we'll be more than happy to answer any of your questions, any of your comments, and to help you further along in this journey. Okay? So, before I let you go, I just want to share some of the words of Christ. Matthew 28, 18 to 20, the Great Commission. It says, And Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples to all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. 
Peace be with you, family. Go and make an impact for Christ. I'll see you soon.